This is the PA Startup Podcast, episode number 27. This is the PA Startup Podcast, where we help pre-PA students, current PA students, and new grads start their careers as physician assistants. I'm your host, Chris Darst. We are glad you're here. Welcome back to another episode of the PA Startup Podcast. We have a great episode today, and this is actually the first of a couple. Um, my guest today, Teresa, was or is an ERPA, and we set out to talk about a day in the life. And it turns out that she went to a residency or a fellowship or a postgraduate program, whatever you want to call it, um, in emergency medicine. And I thought, well, that's really interesting. So let's talk about both of them. Rather than having one mega episode, we would split it into two separate episodes. So today we're going to talk about residencies or fellowships or postgraduate programs. And then the next time we have Teresa on, she will talk about a day in the life of an emergency medicine PA, which is fascinating. So she's going to be my first repeat guest on the podcast. And actually, it sounds as though she is pursuing her clinical doctorate. So we want to talk about that too, because that's a relatively new phenomenon within the PA realms. And I've actually never talked to anybody that's uh, pursuing that. So um, she might even be our first three-peat visitor on the podcast. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with postgraduate programs in PAs, um, it was on a a previous Q&A episode. uh, Do you recommend I do a residency or not? So med students go through med school and then they go to residency and then they can further specialize into a fellowship. So residency, Residency and fellowship in the med school model is different than what I'm talking about here. I will use the terms uh, residency or fellowship interchangeably, but basically it is a period of time after you graduate from PA school where you can further specialize. Now, the goal of a PA is we're family practice trained, so we can really go into any specialty because of our generalized training. Um, But some people love surgery or they love ER or they love something. And so they want to get further training. Now it can help you with the job search and it can help you with your resume looking good. Um, We'll talk about some of the benefits and and even some drawbacks, but um, it is just further training after you have graduated PA school and you can spend an additional certain number of months. It's usually 12 to 18 months. I'll put some resources on the episode page, uh, pastartup.co slash episode 27. And uh, let's just dive into it. And we'll talk to Teresa about being a uh, PA in a residency program in emergency medicine. All right, this is Teresa Broder. Teresa, how are you today? Fine, thank you. Good. Have you ever been on a podcast before? First time. (laughs) Do you have your phone on you? I do. Have you heard this on the podcast before? Yes. So Teresa told me, as you're getting your phone out, I'll say this. Poor girl, uh, she binge listened to the podcast and there was, uh, that's hours of her life. She'll never get back. So what are your top three emojis? (laughs) Top three, the laughing face that's sideways. Okay. With the tears. The sticking out face, or the tongue sticking out Uh with the eyes kind of squinting. And then the hands up like i don't know okay gotcha okay (laughs) so no middle fingers no (laughs) no middle fingers (laughs) no fists okay good well (laughs) she's a happy one then so we're good so um teresa you are a a erpa is that correct correct and how long have you been doing that total you think for about four and a half years four and a half years is that how long you've been out of school then yes four and a half years okay Take us through, like, how did you decide on the PA profession? Like, what got you interested in the, the, the profession itself? Mm-hmm. So when I was in high school, I had an awesome uh, mentor and was really trying to rack my brain. I knew I kind of wanted to do something in the healthcare field, and he had me do an aptitude test. Hmm. And uh, it came up with either a physical therapist or a PA, and I had never really been introduced to what a PA was, so kind of looked into that, looked into physical therapy at the same time, and I started my undergrad, and I went into biology. I figured that would kind of fit either way, and um, I applied early decision to this physical therapy program. It was a three and three, so my junior year, I would have been done with my undergrad, and then I would have started in my senior year on 
um, physical therapy program and I didn't get in. Oh, shoot. So, which <laughs> is kind of a blessing in disguise, you know, because it forced me to reevaluate and think, is this actually what I want to do? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd done sure. some shadowing in physical therapy and, you know, it was okay, but it was mostly just because the test was telling me this is where I was supposed to go. So it was really based on that test, like yeah. the test. That, and so you're like, well, that's what I'm supposed to do. So, right. Yeah. Huh. And really none of my family is in the medical field. Um, so I was just kind of like, okay, well, what now? Okay, what's a PA? So I looked into that, and um, one of the other guys that I, he was a couple years ahead of me in school, and he was the only other PA that I had ever known. So I asked him about it, and it sounded awesome. The ability to go out and practice in a bunch of different specialties and really not have to specialize. And, you know, in five years down, five years down the road, you can switch yeah. and say, okay, I'd rather do this now. Um, that was really intriguing to me because I have paralysis of analysis. <laughs> Difficulty making one decision and sticking to it. Sure, sure. So um, if I could, you know, really have a broad scope and then, you know, as I got out, figured out exactly what I wanted to get into, that kind of was intriguing to me. Cool, so, awesome. Yeah. So um, you applied to school then. Mm-hmm. Just Did you have to change any of your prerequisites or were you kind of on track because you're a biology major? And Just on track with biology as the major and then health sciences minor. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Um, and then applied to school. And where are you from originally? I guess I should ask that. Syracuse, New York. Syracuse, Upstate New York. New York. Okay. Mm-hmm. Sounds good. Uh, so where all did you apply? Or not, maybe where did you apply? But how, how many schools did you apply to the first time? Three. Three? Mm-hmm. Awesome. And how'd it go? It went well. <laughs> so I graduated from my undergrad, and I actually had to take a year off, which was kind of disappointing to me. I wanted to get right out and do it, but they need, what is it, like 1,200 hours or 1,600 yeah. hours of shadowing or experience, and um, I wanted to be an EMT. Oh, okay, sure. So I got into that, but the EMT course was months long, and by mm-hmm. that time, the I would have already had to apply. So oh, gotcha. I was held back a little bit, which is good because then I had the opportunity to make more money as a an EMT and get more shadowing experience in. Sure. And then I ended up applying to Lemoyne College in Upstate, and then Pace University in um, New York City, and okay. then Toro on Long Island. Awesome. EMTB or did you EMTB, go? EMTB. So okay. Yeah. Wow. How long did you do that? That was for almost a year and a half because even when I got into PA school on like Christmas break I would go back and work so that's cool that's really good hands-on contact too like out of hospital stuff and it led well into ER so okay so uh, where did you end up going to school so I went to Le Moines College went to Le Moines okay is in Syracuse and really close to my family so having that network was ideal you know and it also uh Helped that that's the only school I actually got into. Oh, <laughs> I was waitlisted yeah. at the other two, so yeah, it's competitive it's out there for mm-hmm. sure. Well, good. So you had family close by, mm-hmm. um, so uh, good support and things like that. And then, how long is their program there? Their program is what is it? Two years. Two years. Mm-hmm. Okay, so like twenty four months. Twenty four months. Wow, that's Go pretty straight fast. Through the summers, so you're yeah. sitting in class while it's, you know. I mean, it's Syracuse, so it only gets to be like 75 out, but yeah. (laughs) Sure, sure. Um, But that's straight through. I mean, that's a lot of information. That's Mm -hmm. probably one of the faster programs because I think they average like 30 months, Mm -hmm. but it's anywhere from 24 to I think 36 even or some of them. But wow. How did you handle that? Was it quite a big difference from college for you? You know, I worked really, really hard in college too. Um, I don't think I'm one of those people that's just naturally smart. I've had to kind of work at everything. So studying and reading is nothing new to me. Mm -hmm. But I definitely got into PA school and didn't have a whole lot of friends. Didn't (laughs) have any, you know, work-life balance at all. It was all school all the time. And I got into this group of probably two or three students who were just into, you know, we'll get together on a Friday or Saturday night and just study and pimp each other. And yeah. So yeah, good, good. good. Worked out well. So tell me about your rotations then being an EMT. Did that play into what you liked or didn't like in school or how did you, what were you thinking you would end up doing while you were on your rotations mm-hmm. in school? So I was kind of bummed because my first rotation was emergency medicine and even getting into school, I knew that emergency medicine was what I was drawn towards. Mm-hmm. Um, I really liked orthopedics too, because of the whole athletic background and that part of it. So those were my big two draws. Okay. 
Um, but my first rotation was emergency medicine. And <laughs> you're not smart on your first rotation. You no. know nothing. Right, right. You have barely put your hands on a patient, you know. So yeah. coming up with differentials and procedures and it's just – a lot of information getting thrown at you all at once. So, did you get to decide when those were, or were they just assigned and you were stuck with that order? Yeah, they were just assigned to us. Yeah. If for listeners, if you have an opportunity to pick, always put the ones you want to do at the end yeah. because the first rotation is like it's so different than being in the classroom. Mm-hmm. You're learning how to write notes. You're even thinking of like what words do I use to describe what I'm seeing? You know, it's just. It's it's rough. So that stinks that that was your favorite one and it was number one. Right. Oh, no. But I had a phenomenal preceptor. I mean, from day one, he sat me down and he basically went over expectations of this is where you are now. This is where I think you are. And in, I think they were, what, six-week rotations we had? Okay. And at the end of six weeks, this is where I want you to be. Hmm. And um, he... At first, you know, I was more shadowing. I was watching what he was doing. Um, I was shadowing him. And then there were two other PAs that were fairly autonomous in the ER. And it was a small little um, rural hospital in upstate New York. Okay. Almost like an hour to the Canadian border. Oh, wow. Okay. And um, so they had single coverage at night. So it was just one PA that was covering. Mm. Wow. Yeah. You get to see a lot. Intense. Yes. (laughs) Holy cow. And um, I mean, they saw you know, lacerations, simple cough, cold, but then they also had like traumas come in and then they would have to stabilize and ship them down to Syracuse. Wow. Holy cow. So did you do overnight shifts and stuff while you were up there? I did a few overnight shifts. Yeah. Uh Was that intimidating? Like your first rotation out, you're like just waiting for someone to tell you there's something to do. And yeah, I mean, it was intense, Wow. but those PAs are, I mean, they know exactly what to do. Huh. And the doctor's never far away. I mean, he's on call. So sure. if they needed him, he would come in. Yeah, gotcha. Okay. So, um, yeah, I think that was really important for me and the preceptor to sit down, have this discussion of this is where you are, and in six weeks this is where I want you to be. Yeah. As far as developing a differential diagnosis, he had me starting off with, you know, maybe five someone would come in with chest pain. Okay, what do you think it is? Give me your top five things that it could be. Sure. And it by the end of six weeks, it was 15 things. So he really encouraged me to mm. think I was out of the box. Wow, um, that's a good preceptor. Yeah. That's he, awesome. He was great. I should do that like at my normal job <laughs> right. for myself. Right. <laughs> okay, cool. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. So then by the end of that rotation, did you feel like you had just incredible growth in that? I mean, if you're able to come up with now 10 additional differential mm-hmm. diagnoses, that's pretty great. Absolutely. Right? There was a lot of growth there. Um, I think... As far as procedures, too, he normally we just staple like scalp lacerations. Mm-hmm. Um, but he had me in there and he's like, well, this will be the perfect one to really practice your suturing because they're never going to see it. Yeah. So go in there, take as long as you need to <laughs> and, you know, do this laceration repair with regular stitches and I'll come look at it when you're done. Nice. So, wow, yeah, that that's was good. Cool. That's great. That probably yeah. set the tone, though, for the rest of your rotations, didn't it? Mm-hmm. And if anyone didn't have that sort of order to how they did things, it probably was like, wah, wah. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So then, so tell me about the rest of your rotations. What, what did you like, not like? You know, I turned out to like everything. Oh, that's good. <laughs> so what I liked least, I guess, was orthopedic surgery. That's just a little too rough. Clinic mm-hmm. time isn't so much for me, but OBGYN was awesome, which I didn't really anticipate liking the surgical aspect of it and, um, just women's health in general. That, yeah. that was an interest to me. Um, family medicine, again, you're seeing a little bit of everything, mm-hmm. which is cool. Uh, what else did I do? Oh, I did this, um, geriatric medicine slash psych rotation. And the guy was actually, um, a critical care neurologist. Whoa. So day one, we had this lady who had a subarachnoid hemorrhage and we did a ventriculostomy right in the emergency room, <laughs> scrubbed up and he just, yeah, drilled wow. right into her scalp and... Wow. Yeah. That is quite the experience. And that I, was supposed to be the geriatric <laughs> medicine but, rotation. Wow. Yeah. So. Huh. That mm-hmm. is excellent experience, but it probably didn't translate a lot to, you know, actual geriatric medicine. Correct. So, I know nothing about geriatrics. My but. dad used to be a, a 
specialist in geriatric medicine and I don't know that he's ever drilling holes in people's heads. So <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. Yep. Awesome. So everything, everything was pretty good. Everything was good. Good. All right. So what were your, as a, as a student nearing graduation, what were your goals? What were you thinking that you wanted to do when you were done or what was the next step for you? So I'm not really one that just likes to do something. If I'm going to do it, I want to do it well. Okay. And Good. I knew I wanted to do emergency medicine and I wanted to practice to the full scope. And so I wanted to do the procedures. Um, I knew an emergency medicine residency was kind of where I was looking towards. Mm. And my first preceptor had shown me the SEMPA website, the Society of Emergency Medicine PA website, yeah. which is a really great resource to have. And it um, outlined all of the ER um, fellowships out there. Okay. So I took a long look at that, and after 26 years in upstate New York and the, you know, horrible winters and <laughs> snow and blizzards and all that, I was like, anywhere but here. Gotcha. So, yes. Yes. Okay. Yep. Now, we've talked about that on the podcast before, mm-hmm. and we'll get into this in a second here, but um, we've talked about residencies, pro or con, and stuff like that. So in well, let's talk about it first, and then tell me, you know, if it what it translated to for you, because mm-hmm. that's cool. I know a lot of people that have done them, and um, some love them. Some are like, eh, it was fine, you know. So that's great. Mm-hmm. So then, uh, so if you're tired of the winter, I can kind of see where this is going. Where did you <laughs> end up going for residency? So I moved to Southern California, San Bernardino County. Yes. Uh huh. Awesome. Which is... I bet that was just terrible. <laughs> <laughs> it was dreadful. Well, it's an hour east of L.A., so everyone thinks, oh, it's L.A. Well. It's really like the middle of the desert. Yeah, yeah, right. It's like almost to Palm Springs. So yes, <laughs> yeah. Yep. Okay, very good. So, um, how long was that program? That was fourteen months. Okay, walk me through that. I don't, I honestly haven't talked to anybody in depth about it. So, what do you do? What do you do in a fellowship? Mm-hmm. So we started off. Um, there were mentors who were during their second year. So there was about a two month overlap. And they would basically hold our hand through the first, you know, week maybe of the program. We had to do classroom work. Um, we had to do uh, projects and presentations. Wow. So it's just like school. I it's mean, it's a lot like, of classroom didactic stuff. Yes. The two-month overlap. What did those uh, older people do f- during that time? Were they kind of the preceptors? They like ran the show? They were more like mentors. I mean, they weren't running it, but they were you know, a year into their program now. And they basically had two months to kind of show us the ropes. Um, it's almost like, you know, in your, what, second, third year residency where you're, the older people are training you're, you. Yeah, you're kind of pre- precepting the people below right. you. Okay. So how is it um, like a good portion is in the classroom and then you get to actually go out to patients or is it both at the same time? Like you're learning and working so I think it was Tuesday and Thursday mornings. We had classroom work for like four hours maybe. And throughout that time, we were going through, um, you know, we had stuff that we had to read and we had presentations that we had to look over and give, obviously. Um, yeah. But then we had four or five 12-hour shifts. I think it might have been five 12-hour shifts throughout the week, rotating Whoa. days and nights. Oh, man. And within that... Um, emergency medicine residency, we had their separate rotations. So we did an OBGYN rotation. We did a surgical rotation, orthopedic rotation. Mm. Um, Within the hospital that was sponsoring the fellowship, is that right? Within that hospital. And then we went out to a correctional facility and then two other emergency rooms around uh, San Bernardino County. Wow. Mm -hmm. So when you say OB or surgery, it's, it's like you did in school, in PA school, where it's, it's not... O B E R, it's O B. Correct. Right. So you're 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 in it even deeper than you were in PA school. Right. Wow. That's mm-hmm. intense. Mm-hmm. And then you're working the shifts on top of it, right? Mm-hmm. Or those were the shifts, I guess, right? Those were the shifts. And then classroom stuff. Mm-hmm. That's 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 rigorous for yeah. fourteen months. I'd say Man. the the worst part about it was that we had to take call for the other services when we knew <laughs> nothing about it. We would have to take O B G Y on call. Oh, you no know, way. at night or whatever. Yeah. And yeah. We knew nothing about it. Well, it's cheap labor. Like <laughs> yeah. you're, you're, you're paying to be there, right? Cause it's, is there's tuition or did you get paid? So there was a stipend. Okay. Um, it was, I think it was 1125 at that point. I don't know. Minimum okay. wage has a month? gone up or uh, an hour, an hour. Oh, I was like 1125 a month. That's all right. <laughs> oh no. $11 and 25 cents. 1125. Okay. An mm-hmm. hour. 
Wow. Super okay. cheap labor. Yeah, no kidding. That's why they had you cover and call. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. Whoa. All right. So then, okay, tell me about what did what kind of stuff did you see? I mean, compared to, sounds like your ER rotation in school was great, mm-hmm. being r- kind of rural and seeing everything. What changed when you went to the fellowship? What kind of stuff did you see then in comparison? Or what did you get to do? So... We had a pod system in the emergency room during our residency. So there was um, a lower acuity pod, which, and we rotated throughout these pods, but lower acuity, two higher acuities, and then a trauma bay. Okay. Um, and really the residents were in charge of the traumas. We could, when a, we were a level two trauma center. So when traumas were called in, we could go into the room and we could watch the you know assessment happening. We didn't really get too much hands on there. Um, but, Working in the other pods, the residents mostly supervised us, mm-hmm. and we could, you know, do central lines, intubations. Um, occasionally, if we were super lucky, we got a chest tube. Nice. Um, <laughs> but yeah, a lot of sutures, um, and then there would be students as well. So I mean, it was just a huge teaching hospital, and there were two um, attending physicians on, and they would just kind of you know, move throughout the pods during the day or night shift and just see how everything was going. And cool. Yeah, that's cool. cool. And you just kind of learn on the fly. Is mm-hmm. that right? Yeah. You're in it trial by fire. Whole lot of pimping. <laughs> yeah. Whole lot of fake it till you make it. <laughs> now at the end of that, as we've talked before on the podcast, that does it help you get a job? Now that you're on this side of it, what do you think? Do you think that you were, obviously you're better qualified because you've had the experience, but Mm -hmm. um, what did that look like for job prospects when you were done? So the company that the residency was through was called CEP America at the time. Um, Now it's Vituity. And they have a ton of um, emergency coverage in throughout the state of California. So I knew I wanted to stay in California. Mm. And having that emergency medicine residency, that name even tied to it, was huge. Um, Really? So that helped. It was more of my first few interviews were you know, how could they convince me to come work for them? Hey. Which is really nice. <laughs> That's where you want to be. Yeah. Yeah, you want to be pursued rather than, you know, trying to beat out others and begging for a job. Exactly. It, all in the name of the program and the fact that you completed it. It has a really good name behind it. So I would highly recommend. That's cool. That. Okay, tell me this. This is a curveball question. Mm-hmm. But if, what if you wanted to go back to New York? Would you think your residency would have helped you in that regard? I don't necessarily think that the residency or the name would have helped, but I think that it looks good that you want to specialize in something. You're putting your time and your effort. You're getting paid a whole lot less than all of my other PA colleagues I graduated PA school with to go into something. And it just kind of shows your dedication to emergency medicine. I agree with that. Yeah. You probably don't have the, if it's not a national company, Maybe it is, but maybe it's not recognized in certain parts. But mm-hmm. it does show dedication. I will. I agree with you there for sure. Um, I just don't ever know, you know, if I had two applicants and one had CT surgery uh, residency experience and mm-hmm. one didn't, um, I guess I would definitely look real hard at the one that did. But, you know, for us, it seems to be a culture thing. You know, you have to fit the culture. And you can be really smart and really good, but if you're hard to get along with, Mm -hmm. we don't want to spend our time together. (laughs) So, um, but that's great insight. Wonderful insight for, for those of you who are looking for, you know, if you're dead set on one specialty and there is a, a fellowship or residency available. Um, and I use those interchangeable. Is that appropriate to use? I think so. I say residency and fellowship. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I know for physicians that's different, Mm -hmm. but, um, for, for the PA, group. I think it's one and the same. So, um, okay. Good food for thought. Tell me about the application process to get into the residency in the first place. So, uh, it would require a personal statement, uh, three letters of recommendation and mm-hmm. ideally, you know, somebody in emergency medicine, maybe a PA that you have worked closely with that's in ER, um, another physician, and then, you know, some other rotation that kind of shows that you're well-rounded. So okay. Okay. maybe- that critical care, uh, mm-hmm. I think he I was he was actually the critical care geriatric. Oh yeah, psychiatrist. Yeah, the 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 scalp driller. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> awesome. 
Uh, so, so it's it's a whole nother application. Whole nother application process. All right. And mm-hmm. how competitive is it? Do you have any idea, like how many applicants there are for the number of seats open? So I do not know the answer to that. Okay. Nope. Uh, let's just say it's like really competitive, and you nailed it on the first try. Super competitive. <laughs> I got in the first shot. Yeah. We had. 15 to 16 people in our class, but I know that the class after ours grew Mm. to almost 30. So I think that, you know, just like PA school, it's expanding. The class sizes are expanding. More people want to get into it. And yeah. Okay. So you had, how many did you say? 15 to 16? 15 or 16. And then how'd you guys get along? So for the most part, uh, I would say everybody else besides two were from California and even Southern California. Oh, really? (laughs) So, yeah. And I feel like the further along you get in your professional life, the more alike you are. You know, as you get into PA school, you definitely had a lot of similarities with all those people. You all wanted to get into healthcare. Sure. Um, But as you get into emergency medicine and specifically a residency, tons of EMTs, um, you know, yeah, the CNAs are... Kind of all cut from the same cloth. You're, yeah. You're like-minded. Everybody kind of wants that same experience. Right. And being together for 14 months, I imagine you got to know each other pretty well. Got very close. Yes. Yes. Good. Good. Um, Friday nights were usually, you know, we would go out, grab a couple beers and just vent. Yeah. Let it all out <laughs> yeah. from the prior week. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Share stories and things. Yes. I find it almost impossible to be around other PAs without somebody telling a story about a patient. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Whether it's disgusting or annoying or... Well, good. So you you got to know everybody. Um, What did everyone think? Was it a a raving success for everyone in the program or... So we had a few dropouts. Um, It takes a special person, I think, to know that everybody else that's out in the PA world right now is making, you know... Yeah. Money. Good money. And you have debt. More than eleven twenty five an hour or whatever you <laughs> More said. More than yeah. eleven twenty five an hour and um and you're not treated the nicest. I mean, essentially you're, you know, below residence and you're you're second rate citizens. So you huh. have to work for respect. Yeah. And you might get told, you know, five times, no, you can't do this central line. No, you can't do this intubation. Get out of my way. Yeah. <laughs> By the resident. Yeah. Right? Or, okay. or whoever the attending's like, oh no, I'd prefer this person to do it. But you know, that sixth time, as long as you show that you have perseverance and you want to learn and you want to do it. Yeah. They'll, they'll recognize you and they'll let you do it. Okay. So you kind of, yeah, you got to earn it, right? Absolutely. Now, once you earn it, did the, did the behavior change? I mean, the are the residents, they're rotating through also, right? Like the medical residents or were they ER residents? They're like, ER uh, residents. Okay. That's so, their territory. Okay. So mm-hmm. you're stepping, you're stepping on their toes. Mm-hmm. Once you get that respect from them, uh, was it then all good to go from f- each individual one from that point on? I would say some of them are harder to crack than others. <laughs> I mean, some were always, because if you're doing it, they're not. Yeah. Essentially, there's always that competition there. Yeah. Um, but a lot of them were at this teaching facility and they wanted to get into emergency medicine, but they want to ultimately teach or be the attending at some point. So if you can show them that you want to learn from them, they have something to, you know, to give you, you can learn, you want to work hard, then they're going to say, okay, like, let me teach you. Yeah. And a lot of them really liked to teach. Oh, so, that's good. Yeah. That's cool. You kind of have to seek those ones out. Mm-hmm. It's the other ones that are like, no, no, I'm going to do it because I'm the best. Yep. They're like, well, I don't know if I'll crack you, but <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, so then did, did people drop out like halfway through the program or like quarter of the way through the program or did they wait to the end and they were like, this is not for me? So there were some that dropped out at the very beginning for, I think, a couple of financial reasons. Um, and then couple of them got all the way, you know, close to the end. Oh, no. They were so close. Oh, man. And they just couldn't get along, couldn't swallow their pride. And uh, oh. so, yeah, I mean, they were ultimately almost kind of forced out. Oh, gotcha. Um, but, and then once we graduated, there were a couple people like, okay, I'll do anything but ER. I never yeah. want to set foot <laughs> in another emergency room ever. This was the hardest 14 years and or 14 uh, months, not yeah. years. Oh, gosh. Probably seemed like years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like a long time. I bet. Okay, so you finish your residency, mm-hmm. and uh, did that? Did the skills that you learned during that, does that help you today on your job? So 
like we kind of touched on, I don't think it necessarily got me my job. I mean, it's something nice to put on your resume. It's kind of some fluff and it makes them maybe look at you twice. Mm -hmm. Um, But the procedures that I'm able to do today, and there's only, you know, two or three other PAs that are doing lumbar punctures or central lines or intubations. And I think the rest of the PAs are fine with that. They're, they're comfortable with doing what they're doing, Mm -hmm. but I always want to be practicing to that full scope. I want to do as much as anybody will possibly let me do. Yeah. And if someone will teach me to do something new, then yeah, I want to do that. Yeah. Too. Yeah. I'm the same way. Yeah. I think there's, there, there are people out there that are fine with just, you know, kind of middle of the road, but I'm, yeah, give it to me, please yep. let me do it. The more, the better. So, so that, that, uh, I guess we should go back. You, you, when you were done with fellowship, you worked in an ER in California. Yes. Um, uh, for how long? For a couple of years? A year and a half. year and a half. Mm-hmm. Um, and you said that the name alone was what got you your job there, mm-hmm. was that you were being pursued by multiple places. So then when you switched jobs to more the middle of the country, um, it was good experience. Is that would you say that's fair? Yes. Okay. Gotcha. All right. One more thing. Yeah. So in, I guess, throughout the country – everyone uses PAs a bit differently, especially in emergency medicine. Definitely. Um, So in California, what we were doing mostly as PAs and nurse practitioners as well was um, fast track. Oh, okay. So the way that California is going is they have this either MSE, which is the uh, medical screening exam, or some type of uh, PIT, which is provider and triage, and it literally is the PIT. Okay. It's, you know... (laughs) I mean, you see someone and you say, sick, not sick, this person needs to go to the main ED now, or they can wait out in the waiting room for, you know, three, four, five, six hours. Yeah. And I'm not exaggerating. No, I've heard, I've heard that there's actually like billboards that like show wait times and stuff, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's funny because people in Nebraska will complain, you know, oh, I waited in the waiting room for an hour, maybe an hour and 15 minutes. Yeah. If it's a really busy day. Mm-hmm. I'm you not kidding, no idea. six yeah. or seven hours in the ER in uh, California. And it was just, but so PAs are more used for the fast track. We got to go in the main ED maybe, I don't know, two or three times throughout the month. Okay. But for a shift or just periodically for a shift. Okay. So yep. you, okay. T- tell me about that. I don't really know much about that. What's the difference between fast track and main ED versus anything else that's out there? So the fast track, like I said, uh, the provider and triage. So somebody literally sits in what we call the fishbowl. So the triage nurse sits in front of you and you sit behind them and you are doing your essentially clinical assessment. You're, you're looking at the patient and deciding, are they sick? They need to go back right now. You're writing a little, maybe like a soap note. What's their chief complaint? Why are they here? If they have, you know, finger pain or they fell or they punched something and you want to get an x-ray, you order the x-ray right there, that person may never actually go back to get a bed. They might stay out in the waiting room the entire time and then be pulled back into like a little room with like a curtain, have that splint placed and have discharge paperwork with a prescription right there and then and they never actually go back to the ER. Okay. So they're getting care, but it's not like they're brought into a bed and they change into a gown and they, you know, all that stuff. They're right. just kind of, and that's fast track. That's fast track. Okay. Gotcha. For the most part, that is a big part of what they do in California is just to utilize PAs doing the really quick, mm-hmm. simple stuff. Okay. Okay. So, and then if they were sick, let's say acuity, level of acuity, like one, two or three, they would go right back to the emergency room and then they would be seen for the most part, by the physicians, okay. put staff. Back. Okay, awesome. Yep. Uh, how does that compare to now? I mean, in, in Nebraska, in the ER, seems like you guys are all full service, you know, all over the place. So is that, I mean, are you in the trenches just like the physicians are? So, yeah, they pick up a patient, we pick up a patient. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, yeah, it essentially goes one and one. We okay. see exactly what they see, and, I mean, they're always there if we need help or if they're, really high acuity, if their blood pressure is low, if we need, you know, help with medications or, you know, they need to be cardioverted or whatever, um, they're right there. But awesome. yeah, we're seeing what they see. All right. That's cool. So there you have it. Um, Teresa and I were talking about um, 
like tips for being an ERPA. And this was one I couldn't find a place for this, but I thought it was really appropriate. So um, here's her tip for being an ERPA, and then I'll be right back. You know, one of the most important things I would say to getting into emergency medicine as far as like multitasking Mm -hmm. was to be a waitress. That was like the best job that I could have done before emergency medicine because it is really, I mean, you're selling something. It's customer service. You have to um, make everybody feel comfortable, Yeah. right? And it's all about going back and, you know, reevaluating their patient or, you know, going back to your table and kind of saying, how's everything going? Are you guys doing okay? And, I mean, the better you are at being able to multitask and prioritize your time. Sure. No, this is a table that's super needy, or these are the patients that are very acute. Yeah. And they need multiple reevaluations. And so all that, it was kind of... That's true, because I I imagine as a server, you've got people asking, hey, can you bring me some ketchup? Hey, can Mm -hmm. you do that? And you have to remember all that, Mm -hmm. which I would be horrible at. (laughs) (laughs) I literally have to write everything down or else I forget it. So... Okay, so your tip would be yeah. for emergency medicine, Heck maybe, yeah. maybe wait some tables. Yeah. yeah. All right, so that was my discussion with Teresa Broder on uh, PA residencies in emergency medicine. Um, if you go to the show notes at pastartup.co slash episode uh, 27, uh, I'm going to put a link on there that uh, goes to the APPAP which is the association, let me look here, Association of Postgraduate PA Programs. Tons of information on there. And there's actually, if you go up to the top, it'll say Postgraduate PA Programs. And then at the very bottom of that menu, it says PA Program Quick Reference Chart. And that'll open up a PDF. Um, I don't know if I can link it on my site or I'll put a link to the PDF. I won't put the actual PDF, but I'll put a link to it on the site. Um, But it goes through the programs by specialty, and there's a lot of them. Uh, There didn't used to be this much. Um, We've got abdominal organ transplant, acute care medicine, acute care surgery, cardiology, cardiothoracic, critical care, critical care trauma, emergency medicine, family medicine, geriatrics, hematology, hospitalist. So, and most of them are between 12 and 18 months. Um, but it's got the locations, how many people are in the class, um, tons of good information. So check that out. I'll put that in the show notes. Um, as always, you can support the PA startup podcast, uh, by going to PA startup.co slash audible. You can sign up for a free audible trial, get a free ebook, um, a 30 day free trial without paying anything. And that, uh, supports the PA startup podcast. Um, yeah. So if you have questions for the next Q&A episode, send them to questions at pastartup.co. I love hearing from you. So thank you so much. Um, subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any episodes and we'll catch you on the next episode. Dad, uh, we were out longboarding. Major totally biffed it on the longboard. Is she okay? Uh, <laughs> Not well. so much. All right, I'll be right back. I'll be right back. I'll be right back. I'll be right back.